the best experts on Russian disinformation and conspiracy theories. And we are really, really happy that Martin has kindly accepted our invitation. And I'm happy for you that you will have the opportunity to ask um, him some questions after his uh, talk. Uh, Martin is currently a deputy, the deputy director of the Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies at, uh, at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. Uh, Martin will talk today about uh, Russia, the role of disinformation and conspiracy theories in Russian security thinking and how the producers of disinformation and conspiracy theories, uh, its creators, how they sometimes become the consumers of disinformation and conspiracy theories. And this is particularly important for us as uh, for Ukrainian community, since we are at uh, the war with Russian propaganda, and we have been at the war for almost a decade. Uh, so our um, discussion will be organized as follows. Uh, first, Martin will talk for about 45 minutes, and then those of you in Zoom with us, you will be able to ask him questions afterwards. So please note your questions while Martin is talking. And also, those of you who are watching us um, on YouTube, uh, please leave the comments, and maybe we do not guarantee, but we really hope that we will have the opportunity to ask your questions as well. Uh, so, Martin, the floor is yours now. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to join you, uh, and thank you for the invitation and the possibility to, to talk to you here today. Um, I mean, the topic of conspiracy theories and, and this information in, in, in world affairs, it doesn't seem to, to go away. In fact, I mean, there are many signs that the problem is getting uh, 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 bigger. If you look at it historically in terms of research, uh, uh, most interest was focused on the West, uh, the US, to some extent the, the Middle East and the proliferation of conspiracy theories in these parts of the world. In the last few years, <clears throat> a growing uh, amount of body of research has also been uh, addressing uh, the same type of problems in, in uh, Eastern Europe, um, and uh, the former Soviet space. Um, and of course, it's also a topic that gained a lot of significance in light of, of you know, technological changes, the emergence of social media uh, and discussions on how the spread of, 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 of false information, conspiracy theories and disinformation can influence political elections, public opinion uh, in various countries. And since last year, uh, this was also a problem connected to the topic of uh, vaccines uh, and the role of conspiracy theories uh, in uh, hindering uh, an effective uh, public response to the ongoing health crisis related to COVID-19. Um, my topic will, will circle back to, to a very, very specific area, uh, which is Russian security. Um, and I'm drawing here on previous research that I conducted with with, um, with uh, two colleagues uh, who were formerly with me here at the Institute, uh, Erik Andemo and uh, Lilia Makashova. Um, and uh, uh, I will talk on our paper and, and the research that I've done since um, on conspiracy theories in, in Russian security and military thinking. Of course, there is also broader <coughs> sort of uh, uh, research on, on Russia today. I, I would like to mention two good books in English for those who, who could be interested. Uh, one was writ written a few years ago by, uh, by a political scientist uh, in the UK, Ilya Yablokov, uh, called Fortress Russia. Uh, and uh, then uh, there is a, is a New York-based uh, researcher, Iliot Il Borenstein, who, who wrote Plots Against Russia. Uh, from various perspectives, they, they try to address th th this conundrum why did you know conspiracy theories start to emerge on a much more uh, uh, sort of broader uh, scale in Russian public discourse uh, in the last decade? I, I can just give a, give a few examples of, of how conspiracy theories can be present in in um, Russian political discourse. Um, 
you can take, for example, the case of um, uh, Nikolai Patrushev, who was a long time head of the uh, Russian security agency, the FSB, is now the uh, secretary of the very influential Security Council. He has remarked uh, on a number of occasions um, on uh, a U.S. plot to uh, dismember Russia, the territory of Russia, the territorial integrity of Russia, and that the U.S. in particular, that they are plotting to, to overthrow the Russian government. And he refers in, in some of his statements to uh, an alleged statement that was made previously by Madeleine Albright, the former Secretary of State uh, of the US, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, M Madeleine Albright, Albright. Allegedly, they claim, uh, um, she, she, she wanted to dismember uh, the territories of Russia and overtake the oil rich and the natural resource rich territories of Siberia and make them uh, a US uh, uh, protectorate. And he uses this claim, that this, this reference to a statement by Albright to, uh, to, to support his own claim, his own interpretation of, of US foreign policy. The problem is of course that Albright, she has never said anything of, of the kind. The, the quote is a invention and it originated somewhere in, in Russian media in the 1990s, and it has continued to circulate and was never uh, critically addressed, apparently, by a lot of people in Russia. I can also give you another example. Uh, a few years ago, in 2018, the president of Russia, uh, Vladimir Putin, he made a statement to the effect that the US government, again, it's very typical, it very often circles back to the intentions and motives of, of the US government, uh, in, these, in this discourse that the U.S. is operating in, in Georgia, uh, close to the Russian border, that the U.S. government is operating a um, biological weapons program. Um, and it's a particular program that uh, uh, aims to develop a, a, a biological weapon that can target and kill only ethnic Russians, but uh, will leave other ethnicities unharmed. This is again a claim that was circulating in Russia for a number of years when you start to look at it uh, more closely. And before Putin said it, uh, just a few months before, um, it, the claim had also appeared in a report by the Russian Ministry of Defense. So it's obvious that, that conspiracy theories are not only, you know, present in Russian political discourse, uh, public discourse. In fact, conspiracy theories have also inserted themselves into the highest echelons of political power. They are present in the statements and in the minds of, of political decision makers at the key strategic positions in Russia. Um, so the, the question is why? I mean, why is Putin saying these things? Um, why, is, why is Patrushev saying these things? Um, according to, you know, the the broad interpretation uh, of Yablokov and Borenstein, for example, they argue that the, the, the reason is, you know, very instrumental and very political. Um, by spreading conspiracy theories, you can create a very simple mental framework, a map of how the world operates, which is very black and white. Friend, enemy, patriot, traitor. Conspiracy theorists help us formulate an understanding of the world, which is very uh, uh, dualistic, very black and white. So, for example, with the use of conspiracy theories, you can create narratives to target the political opposition, uh, a collective West, which is hell-bent and intent on undermining Russia, and of course, Ukraine, uh, which has been a, a, a big target of, of conspiracy theories in, in the past and, and, and continues to be so. An important question is, of course, to what extent <clears throat> Russian elites who spread conspiracy theories also believe in them. And here I don't have a good answer because I don't have access to the diaries of Putin. I don't have access to, you know, uh, what's being said in the closed meetings of the Security Council or, or in the, inside the towers of the Kremlin. But it's interesting that a lot of these people who are spreading conspiracy theories or conspiratorial frameworks have been doing so uh, for a long time. 
And uh, conspiracy theories, we can say they are at least tolerated and accepted within public discourse in the military and security establishment in Russia. Um, and uh, of course, there are also variations in the degree to which people adhere or spread conspiracy theories. Some people are very radical in their sort of rhetoric, in their, the way they explain how the world operates. <clears throat> others are more, you know, they are, others are more sort of intellectually flexible. People like Putin, they tend to hedge all their statements. So he wouldn't say, you know, I outright believe this. He would rather say, I have heard that the U.S. could be operating a biological weapons program in Georgia. And it would be interesting if, to investigate if that's true. And, you know, it, it would be great if Obama or Trump or Biden or anybody like that could, could be so kind to confirm it. Um, but others are, are, seem to be more convinced. <clears throat> so, so there's also a spectrum uh, within the, the, the sort of uh, field of conspiracy theories. People who are hardcore believers and those who are more moderate in their, in their use uh, and in their interpretations of conspiracy theories. But I mentioned this as an important topic anyhow, because it has policy implications. The presence and spread of conspiracy theories has policy implications for how we interpret, have to interpret Russia. Uh, Russian statements, Russian policies, Russian decision-making at key moments, to what extent have they been formed and shaped or influenced by narratives that could be labeled conspiratorial? Um, the decision to annex Crimea in February 2014 was taken under very sort of dramatic conditions and in a very short period of time and within a very small circle of decision makers in, 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 in Russia. Maybe a handful of people were present when Putin made the decision and elaborated on the idea of annexing Crimea. There were plans, of course, we can imagine that there were military contingency plans for all types of scenarios for a long time. But the decision was made at a very critical moment. And of course, if you really believe that NATO was hell-bent on uh, expanding its military infrastructure all the way to the Russian border in order to overthrow the Russian government, and that was the purpose of the Maidan, well, then in that case, to some extent at least, conspiracy theories have also influenced Russian decision-making at a very critical moment in the history of this country. So we cannot sort of just forget about this topic because as long as Russian decision-makers and policy shapers continue to, 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 to mention and to bring these things up in their own public statements, um, uh, we also have to pay, pay attention. Um, let me take just a, a step back before I continue. Um, what is a conspiracy theory? Because of course, when you label somebody a conspiracy theorist, this is a very hostile action. Nobody likes to be called a conspiracy theorist. Um, the, you, uh, the term in itself is a pejorative term. It, it suggests a certain mental or psychological defect. Um, but in fact, conspiracy theories is better understood, they are better understood as, as a spectrum. And in fact, all people, anyone, all of us uh, are probably present at a spectrum somewhere between the, the sort of mild and radical conspiracy theorists. So for example, somebody here uh, uh, today could have a theory that you have a colleague who is stealing your milk from the office kitchen. You don't have any evidence, but you have sort of a vague notion that somebody that could be your office neighbor is indeed all the time, you know, uh, uh, taking your milk uh, from the refrigerator or taking your tea or, or coffee without asking you. You don't have the proof, but you have a very strong uh, sense. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and this could be labeled a, a mild conspiracy theory. Uh, we don't have any evidence, but we, we choose to believe it because it, it makes sense. It helps us understand what's going on in, in, in a complex reality. And of course, the office space is a very mild uh, uh, form of complexity. But if you think about world affairs, they are tremendously difficult to interpret. 
and multi-layered. And very often we don't have all the facts. And a lot of things are very confusing and people make strange decisions all the time, including people who we think have a lot of good information like the US government or the Russian government, or our own governments in Sweden or Ukraine or whatever, wherever you happen to be listening to this talk. So the simple explanation of what is a conspiracy theory is that it is a, should be understood as a non-conformist non explanation of an event referring to some hidden actions or motives, usually uh, uh, within a, a political or business uh, elite establishment. Um, but th this only helps us, you know, half the way of understanding and, and disentangling the, the, the problem of conspiracy theories. Um, because a conspiracy theory can also be correct. It can turn out that I was, that I, that I was right to, to, to uh, to, to, to think that my, that my colleague was, was stealing my, my, my coffee. Watergate, before somebody could prove it, uh, uh, somebody had to think about this as a reality that could be true, a possibility. And the Watergate scandal turned out to be a conspiracy that actually happened. So sometimes political elites, business elites actually do bring, uh, come together in order to conspire against the public or against their enemies. The problem is, of course, that most conspiracy theories are never proven. Uh, and many conspiracy theories are also too radical to be credible. Uh, and people can believe them anyhow. So the idea that when you go to the hospital for a vaccine against COVID, that in fact they are inserting a microchip into your body so that Bill Gates can monitor all your movements all day because Bill Gates apparently really wants to do this uh, for some reason that, that is never explained. And this is the, the, a, great, a great feature of conspiracy theories is that you don't have to explain why because the person receiving the message is... Um, is expected to, 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 uh, to assume that it's correct uh, uncritically because it makes sense of how the world operates. It fits into a bigger narrative of how we understand the world. And if we think that the world is operated in a certain way, for example, there's a cabal of 10 people who make all the key decisions for the whole world all the time and that they are conspiring and that they are evil. Well, in that case, you know, the claim about vaccines being, you know, a, a plot by Bill Gates, it actually makes sense. You don't have to prove it because it fits into the bigger narrative. Of course, in the 17th century, a lot of people in Europe believed in witches. And eventually, uh, uh, you know, uh, governments had to, uh, had to curb this and they had to take actions against it. Um, uh, and those type of conspiracy theories, they can also be easily falsified, of course, because a lot of conspiracy theories like witches, they, they are based on assumptions that contradict well-known features of how the nature operates. For example, witches apparently can defy gravity, but based on our knowledge of gravity, we can say that witches can, per definition, not exist. Um, but... We circle back all the time to this key dilemma that I was referring to. But for a true believer in conspiracy theories, the absence of evidence do not, does not contradict the, the conspiracy theory. In fact, the very fact that there is no evidence is part of the conspiracy because these evil people, they are plotting and they are so intelligent that they are hiding the evidence from us. So it's no surprise that I cannot prove it because how could I prove it? because the, the, these secret elites are, are hiding all the evidence uh, or they are using some other device to keep people from discovering the truth. So <clears throat> you have these mild conspiracy theories and you have the radical ones. And of course, <clears throat> from a sort of public policy perspective, you know, the more radical the conspiracy theories become, you know, the, the more problematic they can become for the social cohesion of society, for democracy, for security at the sort of uh, last instance. There is also another story at play when we talk about Russian 
security thinking uh, or thinking within Russian military and security circles. Um, and for those of you who are you know, interested in this particular topic, uh, I could reference you, uh, uh, and I, I'm happy to share with, with you know, the organizers of this event also my, my academic research on this topic. But um, what I would like to, to, to just connect here is you know, the problem of conspiracy theories with a bigger problem that was a lot uh, discussed in the last five, 10 years, which is the issue of propaganda and, and disinformation. Because of course, there's a fine line between these various things. Uh, propaganda can spread conspiracy theories. Disinformation can be uh, based on a conspiracy theory. Um, for decades during the Cold War, the KGB, the Soviet Security Service, spread uh, disinformation, uh, in particular, disinformation targeting its main rival, the US or NATO. This was part of the ongoing political warfare. And sometimes they happened to say things that were simply true, but they were sort of amplifying these. So in the 50s, Soviet propaganda would talk a lot about discrimination of blacks in the US. That happened to be based on you know, facts that were true, but they could amplify it because they knew that this was you know, an Achilles heel of the US. It was a soft, it was a weak weakness of, of their political system that, that in fact it was so unequal uh, for, for, for a lot of people in that country at the time. But, but sometimes they would also invent stories. Uh, and again, they would try to invent stories that they knew would be, uh, 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 have some sort of credibility uh, uh, for, the, for the target audience. So you couldn't just invent anything. It has to fit into some broader existing narrative. And for example, that could be a distrust of the government. There's all, there was always a segment of the population in every country that had a sort of already established distrust of their authorities, their government. So you could, if you could fit a, fit a disinformation campaign into that, that uh, broader uh, uh, spectrum of disbelief, uh, then, then you could make, then, then these things could be effective. For example, in the 80s, the KGB together with Stasi, uh, the East German security agency, spread uh, the false claim that HIV AIDS had been developed by the Pentagon. Um, <clears throat> before that, they had spread the claim that CIA was behind the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Um, so how many people, you know, have heard these type of messages? Well, in these two cases, actually quite a lot. Um, in Sweden, I could mention there was a movie director in the 80s who even made a documentary based on the assumption that this HIV AIDS story was true. So he based his own, whole documentary and the idea was that it was supposed to be brought, uh, shown for all students in Swedish high schools as a sort of educational documentary. But it was stopped before that ever happened. But he still, believe, he still believes in this. You, you can find this idea circulated still today in, in the media, in you know, social media and so on. Uh, about 30% or so, at least, of the U.S. population that had, had, had at least heard of the idea that the CIA could be behind the assassination of Kennedy. And, of course, millions of people saw the movie by the movie director Oliver Stone, a movie made in the early 90s, which is based on the story that, the, in fact, it is the CIA who was behind uh, the assassination. And... Uh, um, uh, Roger Stone is, of course, a well-known uh, um, journalist who, who, who nowadays has uh, uh, quite good uh, standing in, 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 uh, with the Russian president, among others. <laughs> um, and so in the 90s, uh, and the, uh, not least in the last decade, as, as, as was you know, researched by Andrei Soldatov and Irina Boragan, among others, they have documented how, how these old active measures, the old KGB handbook tricks, were coming back. And with that, you know, you had the RT, Rasia Sevodnia, Sputnik, and all of that, the big sort of broadcasters in different languages, the social media presence. You also have the more covert campaigns, <clears throat> the disinformation campaigns that are used 
that are built around fake accounts, uh, that are fake websites, uh, fake news stories that are inserted into various communities. And sometimes we have seen how these could be also affected. Of course, after the US presidential elections in 2016, uh, this became a key uh, uh, topic discussed uh, everywhere in, in the world, at least in the West, in, in Europe and the US. Um, and of course, when you think about this, that the fact that the Soviet security agencies and then their, their successor organizations in the 90s and in the last two decades, that they continue to operate within the same sort of uh, uh, handbook for, for political warfare, you start wondering, well, at some point, will there be feedback effects? That, you know, people who are producing all of this propaganda, all of this disinformation, spreading these conspiracy theories, will they eventually also be victims of their own statecraft? Um, this is unbelievably difficult to, to document, of course, because um, it's impossible to ask someone who is spreading these type of claims, fake claims, whether or not you know they are doing it deliberate, deliberately, or they are conscious about it, or unconscious, uh, unconscious, or where they got the information from. Very often, people are unsure. But there is a good story, a, a good case, and it's also a good reference for a lot of people who could be interested in this topic. So you can read more about it. it is a recent book by a uh, U.S.-based uh, scholar, but I think he's from Germany originally, Thomas Ridd. He published last year a book called Active Measures, which is one of the best books on, on uh, uh, the sort of Russian uh, propaganda and disinformation techniques. Um, and he has a story that goes back all the way to the 1920s, uh, which is, uh, has different names in the literature, but some, uh, you can, we can call it simply the Tanaka Conspiracy. It was a document that was circulated in the Soviet Politburo uh, at least in 1925. And it was brought to the attention of the Politburo by uh, Lev Trotsky. Trotsky claimed to have got access to this document. Uh, sorry, it was not Trotsky, it was uh, Dzerzhinsky, the head of the uh, Soviet uh, security agency at the time. He claimed to have got this through uh, uh, contacts in, in the Far East, in the uh, sort of uh, troub troubled ch territories of China at the time where you know, Russia and, and, and China uh, and Japan uh, and the, the UK were struggling for influence. And he claimed that, Dzerzhinsky claimed that there is a document written by the prime minister of Japan, Tanaka, which has a big, you know, sort of a grand plan for the dismemberment of, of China and how they would do it by occupying various parts of, of Chinese territory, by taking over certain industrial regions, and, uh, and uh, uh, deporting people from other parts of, of the region. Uh, Trotsky was actually one of the people who, who, who questioned the authenticity of this document. But um, the document continued to have its own life. And of course, uh, an interesting uh, feature here was the changing reality of the 1930s when Japan was indeed becoming openly imperialistic in its claims against China. And uh, this document then became also more visible in the public. It, people, you know, there were publishers, newspapers who started to publish and spread this document as authentic, as evidence of Japan's true intentions. And the NKVD, the predecessor organization of the KGB, they published it through their Soviet publishing houses in the US, also throughout the 1930s. And so when the J Japan bombed, uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, um, uh, this document uh, was uh, became tremendously influential also in the US domestic political debate because it gained all of a sudden new credibility. It was a sort of a key document, a founding document of Jap Japanese imperialism. But after the war, it was concluded that in fact, it was a forgery as many people had expected from the beginning. Um, but uh, as Thomas Ridd uh, then documents, and it's a great to my, to, it was to my great surprise that in a recent uh, uh, sort of uh, official publication by the SVR, the Russian Foreign Espionage Agency, 
uh, uh, in a volume edited by its legendary head, uh, uh, Primakov. They actually mentioned the discovery of this document in the 1920s as one of the agency's greatest achievements, as a proof of how efficient the Soviet intelligence agencies were uh, in the 20th century in finding out and infiltrating different governments in parts of the world. And uh, the Tanaka conspiracy, of course, gained credibility because it fit into a larger reality, which actually gave it, to some extent, its sort of uh, truthiness, as it's sometimes called. We can also mention another document that, that, is, that continues to be widely circulated, and which is much more well known than the Tanaka conspiracy, which is the uh, Protocols of the Elders of Zion. That was published already before the World War I and before the Russian Revolution. And it's a document that is alleged, that claims to be a document, you know, documenting a meeting in a small Jewish circle of key players, uh, documenting how they conspire to, to sort of operate and, and, and control world affairs. This document continues to be circulated all, all across the world, in particular in the Middle East, but also in parts of Asia. Uh, in the West, in, in Europe, it's mostly cited by neo-Nazis and fascist organizations, conspiracy theorists, and so on. Very often in these big conspiracy theories, for some reason, the people who conspire decide to write down their evil plots in a document. And for some reason, they lose this document. Not only are they so stupid that they write down their evil plans and intentions, including, you know, the ha 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 in brackets. Uh, they also lose the document and they do it all the time. Protocols of the elders of Zion. They, they could control the world, but they couldn't keep, you know, their paper trails in check. Uh, the Tanaka, uh, you know, document, the Japanese were so conniving, so clever, but for some reason, you know, they couldn't manage their own bureaucratic documents. And we see this time and again and again. So in a few years, uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, all of a sudden I, I, I saw on Twitter that my name was mentioned in very sort of uh, unusual manner. Um, it was claimed that I was part of an evil British organization called Integrity Initiative. And the, part, the, the, the plot here was that the UK government was intending to create a European network in order to undermine uh, democracy and create color revolutions uh, uh, in uh, the um, uh, parts of Europe that were not under the control of the UK and the US governments. And a lot of well-known and very you know, respected people were on these lists together with my name and I'm, I, I was certainly not the most well-known person there. You had people like Anne Applebaum, Ed Lucas, well-known journalists, academics, and people. So in a way, it was a good context for me to be mentioned in. On the other hand, it was a bit strange because I had no idea that I was part of this evil network. And uh, in fact, uh, you could easily uh, prove uh, that, that I was not. This didn't prevent the biggest tabloid in Sweden, Aftonbladet, with millions of readers on a daily basis from actually publishing this story, claiming that it's true. They were later, um, they were later um, you know, uh, criticized by the press uh, ethics uh, agency in Sweden uh, for publishing fake news, uh, but, but, but they have continued to, to, uh, to defend uh, their articles um, about me. And this again shows how conspiracy theories and disinformation, if they are inserted into a particular context where people can uh, 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 think, uh, sense that, it, that they are credible, then without any shred of evidence, uh, uh, you know, they, they will take it uh, as true. And in this case, you know, the editor who was responsible for the article about me, she was a well-known old sort of communist a supporter who has been vocally critical of US you know, foreign policy for, for 20 years and so on and so forth. So the idea of a US or UK based you know, secret network conspiring to undermine Russia, which she has defended on numerous occasions, 
of course, you know, that, that made sense to her. It fit into her bro a broader ideological or mental uh, 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 map of the world. Um, so, so that's so, sort of broadly about the problem of how, you know, when you talk about Russia in particular today, how, you know, on the one hand, you have these government agencies, the security agencies that are for decades were spreading this information. And at the same time, you know, it turns out that they may not only be producers, but also consumers of the very same type of information. And this is why we became interested in this topic to some degree. And what we did in, in, in the article that I sort of, that I'm basing my talk on is that we analyzed uh, four sort of key journals in the Russian language that are published in the sphere of security and military affairs. They are also journals that have sort of a high level of uh, credibility and legitimacy in the in the political system of Russia because they are connected to you know the military academy or to the MOD or they are connected to the Kremlin somehow directly or indirectly. Four journals: uh, Journal of Military Thought, the Herald of the Academy of Military Sciences, uh, the journal Problems of National Strategy, and uh, a newspaper uh, called Vayana uh, Promyshlony uh, Complex, Military Industrial Complex which is a newspaper of the Russian defense industry. And we analyzed uh, articles there for a period of 10 years, 2008 to two, uh, 2018, uh, studying about 500 articles. We uh, applied qualitative analysis uh, of texts, but also quantitative analysis uh, using data-driven analysis to find, for example, the prevalence and frequency of certain keywords that were interested, uh, that were interesting for us. And uh, I won't give any sort of big details because the authors of these articles are often, you know, not very well known, but they are people inside the security and military establishment. But there are a few key main narratives that, that you know, that are obvious when you, when you start analyzing these articles. Uh, one is the discussion that about the US, in particular the US or NATO and the US sort of intentions and plans, uh, which is all about you know, US hegemony, Russia under threat. So it's a, again, a very black white or sort of uh, simple sort of uh, a framework where, where you know, everything circles back also to Russia. And this is also a feature of a lot of conspiracy theories that they are always about you. Uh, uh, most people who, who, you know, spread conspiracy theories tend to, you know, believe in conspiracies that are targeting themselves. Uh, and so, and this is true also here. So when you, in all of these plots that are described, none of them are about plots against, you know, China or Sweden or Australia. They're always about, you know, U.S. Western plots against a particular country, Russia. Um, and uh, when you look at the sort of... Um, particular conspiracy theorists there are on the one hand, you know, these broader narratives about, you know, Western uh, uh, intentions and so on. But you also have a certain, a, a number of articles that sort of harkle back to very typical and very specific cons conspiracy uh, theory uh, IDs. For example, uh, George Soros uh, is a, a common topic uh, and you, will, you know this also from, you know, other countries in different places. Uh, that he always appears in various contexts. Um, another, another sort of uh, concept that you hear and, or read about in many articles is Novo um, Mirovo um, Paryadok, or sometimes just written NMP, New World Order in Russian. And so they use it as a short, short, shorthand language because the reader is expected to know what is meant. And of course, you can use this, this expression as a neutral term. You can say, you know, I will be so happy if we have a new world order. But, but of course, in a conspiratorial framework, you know, you would write this with capital letters or just the, uh, you know, the acronym NMP in Russian or NWO in English, for example. And now I hope that nobody will steal this video and edit it uh, and just take the part where I say I, I would like to see a new world order, because that could really be twisted in a way that is uh, detrimental to my to the image of me uh, in social media or in conspiratorial websites. 
Anyhow, I won't joke more about that. Uh, another term you find very often is uh, organized chaos, uh, uh, which also is a, a concept that you find um, um, used by you know uh, Russian you know public leaders like Sergei Lavrov, Sergei Shoigu have used it, um, and it is also this idea that the управляемый chaos. So it's the idea that you know. Uh, about you know regime change, color revolutions, and the sort of that the U.S. is controlling these operations as a tool of their foreign policy state. And also, you find references to these fake documents, like uh, uh, Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Another popular document, I'm sure a few people have heard about here, is the so-called Dull Plan. Not dull as in boring, but dull as in former CIA director Alan Dull after World War II, who apparently also wrote a blueprint for the destruction of Russia. And again, they lost the document. A top secret US government document about the destruction of Russia was lost. Uh, but it's only quoted in, in Russian media uh, because uh, of course, uh, other governments, other media elsewhere in the world refuse to publish anything of the kind because they are under, they are under the control of, uh, of this plan. Um, but um, uh, this is also evidence, of course, that also in academic Russian media, uh, Russian sort of academic discourse, that you even find these re references, not just to the sort of conspiratorial narratives, but even the, the, the sort of the forgeries and, and the, the, the sort of obvious disinformation. Uh, and, and, uh, and still they are, they are referenced in, in, in these uh, journals. And so just to conclude, uh, I'll just make a few sort of minor remarks. Um, when you analyze these type of journals, when you read them, uh, you'll discover that, of course, that a lot, there are a lot of neutral articles. Uh, not everything is, you know, off, um, far from it. You can find interesting articles about, you know, weapons technology or lessons from previous battles and weapon battle experiences that, you know, the military is learning from. But also, on the other hand, Conspiracy theories, you, you find them, they are present in these journals for the whole time period that we analyzed. So it's not that in this particular sphere that they, it actually got worse. It's rather that it was there all the time. And it was present when Putin decided to start utilizing it, when he became more conspiracy theory minded. The, this discourse was already there. It was prepared. It was available for them to use it. Conspiracy theories we can see are, you know, spread, they are tolerated, and they are legitimized in this sphere because these are academic journals, they are connected to the official, you know, uh, most important government bodies in Russia, like the Kremlin or the Ministry of Defense. These are articles that if you publish, you know, in these journals, um, you can have an academic career. So, I mean, these are recognized as, you know, traditional academic journals. Um, it's also, it should also be noted that in contrast to conspiracy theories in, in the West and many other parts of the world, in Russia, the conspiracy theories that we found are always pro-government. So in the US, the conspiracy theories are typically anti-government. Uh, anti-US, that is. And, and, and the logical conclusion would be that in Russia, conspiracy theories should also be anti-government, but anti-Russian government, <laughs> but they are not. Also, these conspiracy theories are against the US. So here's also an, a sort of asymmetric uh, uh, feature of, of this particular discourse. Um, and of course, uh, uh, lastly, um, you know, uh, one wonders about, you know, the cognitive effects that this can have on the reports that eventually land on the table of the Russian president. Because apparently, according to the sort of sources we have available about decision making in Russia, Putin receives, you know, two or three files on his desk every morning, you know, from the FSB, the GRU and the MFA. And, you know, he has to choose which one to read. And if he picks up a, a, a file from the Russian military or from you know, the FSB, 
it's not unlikely, apparently, that, that you know, he will be exposed to, to these type of conspiracy theories because they are existing in this sort of climate, in this broader, uh, uh, broader uh, 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 sort of e ecosystem in, in the Russian uh, security uh, and military sphere. Of course, we have no evidence that he is directly influenced by it, but it's interesting to note that it's there, it's present. Um, another feature is, of course, that it makes, you know, this debate and the frameworks that you have in Russia for the public debate uh, makes uh, self-correction much more difficult. And I will give you an example of what I mean. So in 2003, George W. Bush was claiming that Saddam Hussein was possessing weapons of mass destruction. And this was the causes belly for the invasion of Iraq. After they come to Iraq, they discover that there were no weapons of mass destruction. There was no evidence for it. And so there was a huge discussion in the US about what had went wrong, about how you had to reform the CIA, the Pentagon, all of these communication systems in the US security establishment in order to avoid such cognitive biases to lead to such disastrous miscalculations in foreign policy. But such self-correction is not available in the current Russian system, or at least such space for self-correction has been much more narrow because the, 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 the frames that are allowed within this discourse where you have these conspiracy theories, they provide very little flexibility. And as a result, it's very difficult to see how even a political leader in Russia who would like to reduce tensions with the outside world for various reasons, uh, uh, how, uh, how that could be hampered uh, uh, and that there could be challenges there. So this is of course also a, a policy implication when we think about Russian foreign policy ahead that we, that we should take into consideration based on the discussion about what I just said. But, I, but I'll stop there uh, and, and thank you for, for being so patient with me and listening. And I'm, I mean, I look forward to, this, to our discussion. Thank you very much, Martin. It was very interesting. Dear YouTube viewers, we are, thank you for watching. And now we say goodbye.